Whatever the circumstances, if Jesus was alive, then he and his disciples face a serious problem. If Jesus was placed in the tomb and somehow was revived, he himself would certainly think that was an act of the grace of God. I came right to the bars of death and was brought back. But now there's a practical problem. It's a political problem, actually. Romans basically do one thing to messiahs. They crucify them. It is clear that either through resurrection or resuscitation, Jesus did survive the crucifixion. But he faces a problem. He's a condemned man. The Bible is said to solve this problem with a miracle called the Ascension. Jesus is taken bodily into heaven. But the original texts are even more confused when it comes to the Ascension than they were about the Resurrection. The Ascension does not actually appear in the original form of any of the Gospels. The Ascension references in Mark are among the verses which, as we have seen, were added 200 years after the events. There is one line in Luke which reads, and was carried up into heaven. But again, this doesn't appear in all Bibles. It was, in fact, inserted simply because the Ascension is referred to in a later book of the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, and it's always been assumed that Luke was the author of Acts. There's no Ascension in Matthew, and John's Gospel ends with the enigmatic words, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what were the many other things that Jesus did? One of the stories that emerges from this question depends upon another heretical idea, that Jesus' relationship with Mary Magdalene was a very special one, perhaps even a sexual one. If you read John's Gospel, the first person who saw the risen Christ, i.e. the first Christian, was Mary Magdalene. So I think when the church tries to sideline the idea that Jesus had relationships with women, that he had close relationships with women, it's laughable, really. I mean, it's part of this problem that they always say that, um, that the thing that non-believers find hardest about Jesus was his divinity, and the thing that Christians always find hardest about Jesus was his humanity. I mean, he was a, he was a man. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with the concept that, that, that Jesus had a relationship with Mary Magdalene, that, that it was long and important and, you know, was one of the dominant things in his life. He was human. Some historians go even further and suggest that Jesus and Mary might have married and that they might even have had children. So if we are trying to find out where Jesus could have gone, perhaps we should start by finding out where Mary went. There is a tradition that some years after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene came to the Camargue region of the south of France here she lived and died, and the Basilica of Saint Marie Madeleine is a shrine to her memory. This was the center of what became known as the Cult of the Magdalene. The Cult of the Magdalene was very powerful in France up until the Middle Ages. The faithful wanted to believe in a mother figure, and the church were very anxious that they should not believe in Mary Magdalene as having been a mother figure for obvious reasons, which were that she might have been the spouse of Christ, that she might have had his child, that she might have produced a bloodline. The local legends describe how Mary Magdalene came here with her brother Lazarus and her sister Martha and a few companions. Perhaps then, if the relationship between Jesus and Mary was as close as some sources suggest, one of those companions, traveling incognito for fear of arrest by the Romans, was Jesus himself. Jesus could have taken ship at Caesarea or one of the smaller ports up the Syrian coast, and he could have left for another life. And he could well have arrived, as a lot of people believe, in this part of France and begun a new life. He could even have brought his family with him. So these stories could have a historical foundation. After her death, Mary Magdalene's relics were placed in a sarcophagus and then hidden. 
It wasn't until 1279 that they were rediscovered. This basilica was built for their safekeeping and sealed within the crypt in the center of the church is what is claimed to be the skull of Mary Magdalene. The idea that Jesus went to the south of France may seem far-fetched. After all, if any of the stories were true, it's hard to believe that the original writers of the Gospels could have completely eradicated all the evidence. If the faithful knew that Jesus was in fact still alive, surely they would have shared that knowledge, and surely they must have hoped that at some time in the future it would have been safe for Jesus to return, and evidence for that hope should be somewhere in the original text. It is. The disciples were expecting Jesus to return. They were expecting what has become known as the second coming. But this was not necessarily going to be a miraculous return. Jesus definitely went away. Whatever view of resurrection you take, resuscitation or divine miracle, in the traditional sense of belief in resurrection, he goes away. He says, I'm going away. The disciples say, can we come? He says, no. And he says, I'm going to come again. Now, what's interesting about that is normally, if someone says they're going away, and they're going to come back, and you're sort of looking at your watch or your calendar, wondering, okay, he said he went away, he's going to come back. You would take it in that uh, everyday sense. The concept of a heavenly second coming with Jesus returning on the day of judgment was only created after it became clear that he had not returned in that everyday sense. That key Christian idea of the second coming, that, that Jesus having come once and died and risen from the dead will come again, is very much a distinctive Christian idea. It's, uh, Christianity borrows most of its ideas from Judaism, but this is one that it thought up on its own. If you look at the Messiah tradition in, in Judaism, and obviously when Jesus was around, the Jews were expecting their own Messiah. They were expecting him to come and sort everything out, and that would be an end to it. They weren't expecting him to come, half sort things out, die go off somewhere and then come back a bit later on. This, this, is, this is really, the second coming is, is, is one of the distinctive Christian ideas. But does the concept of a heavenly second coming ignore the very matter-of-fact nature of some of the references to it in the Bible? A lot of those references to Jesus coming back might in fact be taken more uh, in an everyday sense of someone going away to accomplish certain mission and then planning to return when that mission was accomplished. But if Jesus did leave Palestine, France still doesn't seem a likely destination. It was, after all, a Roman colony. Some claim that if Jesus did survive the crucifixion, his first priority would be to escape from the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire. You just look at a map. Palestine is on the uh, far eastern border of the Roman Empire. If you go west, you're going right into the heart of Roman territory where we have our 15 legions stationed around the world. If you go east, you're crossing over into Parthia and you're going towards Persia eventually and India and Afghanistan, that direction. And if Jesus thought he was the Jewish Messiah, there was another reason why he might have traveled east. People forget that the Messiah's got to do essentially two things. Everyone remembers he's got to bring world peace and justice and defeat evil. That's all the way through the prophets. When the Messiah comes, he's the Prince of Peace. But the other huge task is he's got to gather all the scattered tribes of Israel back to the land of Israel. Now, this takes a bit of explaining, but it's not too complicated. The people we know today as the Jews are only one tribe, the tribe of Judah. And we have in the Hebrew Bible the story of ten of the tribes being taken away to the east, to the northeast, by the Assyrians in the 8th century B.C. They become known in history as the Lost Tribes because nobody know exactly, knows exactly what happened to them. We do, though, we can speculate that if Jesus thought of himself as the Messiah, 
he might have had in mind, I've got to go and present myself to these uh, dispersed brothers and sisters off wherever they might be. The journey east from Israel in the first century was surprisingly easy by land or by sea on the Silk Route or the Spice Route. It's an accepted fact, for instance, that the disciple Thomas traveled to India and founded a church there. The great tradition of the Indian church is that it was founded by Thomas the Apostle. To travel to India would be no problem. He just had to go down to Gaza and link up with one of the spice trains returning and then from Yemen get a boat to India. It would have been a very simple, easy procedure that was done regularly. And there's another reason Jesus might have been tempted to travel east. But to understand that, we have to go back to the year of his birth. We all recognize the story in Matthew's Gospel of the three wise men who followed a star and presented themselves and their gifts to the baby Jesus. What we perhaps don't recognize immediately is the similarity between this story and the traditions of a religion that is 500 years older than Christianity, Buddhism. When a great Buddhist holy man or Lama dies, wise men consult the stars and other Romans and set off, often on extraordinarily long journeys to find the infant who is the reincarnation of the Lama. When the child is old enough, he is taken away from his parents and educated in the Buddhist faith. Could this be the origin of the story of the three wise men? Could Jesus have been taken to India as a child and taught to be a Buddhist? The Russian writer Nikolai Notovich, traveling in India in the 19th century, discovered an ancient manuscript in a Buddhist monastery in Tibet. In his book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, Notovich translated this manuscript, and it tells of a divine child called Isa, born in the first century to a poor family in Israel. Isa came to India at the age of 14, where he learned the laws of Buddhism before returning to Israel at the age of 29. This idea would certainly explain the otherwise odd fact that from the age of 14 to 29, there is absolutely no record of Jesus' existence in Palestine. Certainly, the later teachings and miracles of Jesus have uncanny parallels with the teachings and miracles of the Buddha. Loving your enemies and the idea that the meek will inherit the earth have absolutely no tradition or precedent in Judaism, but they are entirely consistent with Buddhism. He cometh unto them, walking on the sea. He walks upon the water without parting it, as if on solid ground. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Riches make a man greedy, and so are like a caravan, lurching down the road to hell. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Let the wise man do righteousness, a treasure that others cannot share, which no thief can steal, a treasure which doth not pass away. But if Jesus traveled or returned to the east, Surely there would be legends, like those in the south of France, to support the idea. And of course, there are such traditions. In fact, the people here in Kashmir call their tribe Ben-e Israel, and claim to be descendants of the lost tribes. And here there are stories that in the first century, Isa, known locally as Yus Asaf, meaning leader of the healed, returned to Kashmir in his thirties. Yusasaf's ministry here can easily be seen as a continuation of the Jesus ministry. In 
In a local temple called the Temple of Solomon, there used to be an inscription which told of Yusasaf's claim made about 50 AD to be Jesus, the prophet from Israel. तमाम कश्मीर की तारीखों में यही लिखा है कि ये बाहर से आया है ये ये प्रॉफिट था ये पैगंबर था और इसराइल से आया नस्वैन से अंदर बॉर्डर में आया है और फिर यही तबली कर रहा है रहा है वही चीज जैसे वही मसीह भी है क्योंकि यूज असद के मायने हैं जो कोडी के मरज में हूँ उनको शिफा देने वाला उनका इलाज करने वाला जो शफा याब हुई उसको यूज असद के दूसरे मायने हैं कि यूज असद के दूसरे मायने हैं जमा करने वाला यूसफ कंटिन्यू टू टीच एंड टू प्रीच इन कश्मीर अंटिल ही डाइड अराउंड द ईयर एटी ए डी He was buried in Srinagar. And this rather modest building is, they say, his tomb. The first shrine erected around the site was built in 112 AD. In fact, it is now a shared grave site. In the 15th century, the Islamic holy man Syed Nazir Uddin was also buried here. Although both the gravestones under the cloth point north-south in the Islamic tradition, the body of Yusasaf is buried beneath in a grave dug east-west in the Jewish tradition. But this is a sacred site, and short of exhumation, there is no way of discovering whether the body buried here is that of a man who once survived crucifixion. However, Next to the sarcophagus are the carved footprints of Yusasaf and they do have marks or scars on them. Achhi umar mein ye fort ho gaya hai aur uske paon ke nishanat ka patthar par unhone kunda kar rakhe hain jaise ki the waise hi rakhe hain nishan ke taur par unme zakhm ke nishanat bilkul saaf nazar aate hain. जो सलीब पर चढ़ाने की वजह से उनके पाव में जख्म आए थे द पोजिशन ऑफ द स्कॉज जस्ट बिहाइंड द टोज डो नॉट मैच इच अदर बट दे वुड अलाइन इफ अ सिंगल नेल वॉज ड्रिवन थ्रू बोथ फीट विद द लेफ्ट फुट प्लेस्ड ऑन टॉप ऑफ द राइट There are many who believe this to be the tomb of Jesus. If this is the tomb of Jesus, then he spent most of his life in the mountain kingdom of Kashmir. He did not die on the cross. There was no resurrection. He did not ascend into heaven, and he does not sit at the right hand of God. For many Christians, this would be the end of christianity as we know it for some the original story would still have the power to comfort us as we approach death for me the resurrection is about death the two things that will happen to us all in our life is that we'll be born and that we'll die they're the two things we know nothing about and we have this great void before and we have this great void afterwards So in Jesus' resurrection at the end of the, the Easter story is, is the symbolism of our own resurrection, of our own new life. That in many ways is the great strength of, of, of Christianity. And I think to kind of get away from it, to get away from that incredibly powerful symbolism of the resurrection that touches each and every one of us because of the reality of what will happen to us and start debating whether, you know, bones in a tomb matter or whether it actually happened completely misses the point of Christianity. But for some theologians, the story of the resurrection is little more than a witness to the grief 
felt by the disciples at the loss of their leader. My own working assumption is that Jesus' followers were scattered and discouraged, as they said, and that some of them became convinced that he was actually alive. I don't know how that happened, but certainly it does happen, even today, that many people with a sudden or not sudden loss, uh, bereavement, become convinced that the person that they thought they had lost is somehow alive. And that conviction apparently was very powerful for some of these people, and then it spread. For others, the resurrection is purely a symbol of the continuing power of Jesus, summed up in the experience of the two disciples who had not recognized the risen Jesus until he broke bread with them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. The person who wrote that was not trying to describe an apparition. It's, it would be like, a, like a, a preacher on Easter Sunday saying Jesus is among us this morning and you don't expect people to go looking under the, the, the seats for where is he? They understand. It's the presence of Jesus they're describing. In one sense, it's a perversion of resurrection to reduce it to a body coming out of the tomb, do you, do you not believe? And it's bad history, not just bad theology. Tomorrow, we follow a group of American missionaries devoting their lives to making a new version of a 25-year-old film about the life of Christ, which they're specifically targeting at a Muslim audience, selling Jesus at 10. Next tonight, which is the better read, Bridget Jones or Pride and Prejudice? A battle of the books coming up.